Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spect imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Well, today we have a very special guest, Andy Ramage, and he's actually joining us from across the pond, right? So from London, and this is really fun. This is called One Year No Beer, and Andy Ramage is a former professional athlete turned oil broker, sort of interesting, and he is a former what we would call soccer player, what they call football, currently runs Alpha Energy, part of the OTC Global Holdings, the largest independent commodities brokerage in the world. And he's also a master practitioner of NLP, something very near and dear to my heart, which I absolutely love, a mindfulness-based awareness coach, currently studying for master's degree in positive psychology and coaching psychology. He has a love of well-being, and peak performance. And this led Andy to stop drinking alcohol in the face of massive social pressure, as you might imagine. He runs a brokerage in the city, so not drinking is almost unheard of. But from this experience, he realized that there were probably millions of others out there that were desperate for a break from alcohol who could not overcome this pressure. So he wrote a book and co-founded a movement with her, hopefully I say this correctly, Rory Fairbairns, very Scottish, called One Year No Beer, a 30, 90, or 365-day alcohol-free challenge to change people's perception of alcohol. So this unique background, education, experience of running One Year No Beer make him one of the world's leading habit change experts, and we are so blessed to have you with us today. So welcome, Andy. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here and, and see how sunny it is over there. <laughs> yes, it pro- you probably don't see quite as much sun where you're at. so no, Which right. means vitamin D is less in right. England for sure. I, we love this topic. And, you know, the podcast called The Brain Warrior's Way because we know you're in a war for the health of your brain exactly. and well, your uh, body and and this is part of the war which is alcohol people think of it as a health food it's you know if you're not drinking there's something the matter with you tell us your story how how did this evolve for you yeah well really uh, it probably starts when i fell into the city As, as you mentioned i started out life as a professional soccer player and i played till i was about 23 years old and unfortunately as happens to many young men um injury cut my career short and i loved it you know it was it was my passion it was my everything in life um and then i found myself bumming around traveling meeting new pe- people experiencing new things and eventually i ended up in the city of london in in a broken job in oil specifically and that culture that community is very much a social environment and that being social involves alcohol it's how you entertain and at that stage of my life, I built this persona around me. It's how I met my friends, it's how I met my wife. It was basically everywhere in my life, this whole, this whole thing called alcohol. And it had really started to, to take over, but I hadn't really noticed it, you know, at this point. I was, you know, outwardly very successful, like lots of people are in the city, and had all those obvious trappings of that success, but something was missing. So I was this sort of six out of 10, when really I wanted to be an eight or a nine out of 10. And that sort of led me on, on an adventure, really, to look at all things well-being, from mindfulness to NLP. I started to look at my diet. I started to look at exercise. But nothing would really stick because I'd go out on a Wednesday lunchtime or a Thursday night and go and drink too much and wake up, you know, the following morning, hungover, lethargic, tired. And all those great plans would go out the window. So I just couldn't get a, a good run of anything. And then one day, it, it just dawned on me. I thought, you know, I've got to address the elephant in the room, which was alcohol. And that scared the life out of me. How much were you drinking when 
you decided it was a problem? Yeah, I mean, not excessively compared to my peers or most people in the city. And I think that's an important message to get across here that there was no problem, as it were. This this was me actually taking a proactive stance because I think there's so much mythology around alcohol, especially that anyone who wants to stop, there's an association, they must have a problem when that's actually not the case at all, especially for me. I, I didn't have that classic problem. I just wanted to be fitter, faster, better at my job, healthier, uh, more productive, more dynamic. And, and alcohol realized. wasn't helping you. Right. You, I mean, you came to the realization it wasn't helping you. But uh, so how many um, drinks were you like a having week in a, a week? Yeah. I mean, look, let's say on a daily basis, four or five drinks during the week. Four or five. Yes. Yeah. And then a week. So, so could, not a lot. Could, yeah, that's not considered technically a lot of alcohol, but you noticed it really slowing you down. Oh yeah, and then obviously that could it could blow out at, at the weekends, but it's just that constant grind of lack of sleep, lethargy, tiredness that was actually holding me back. And, and it, the bigger problem was a psychological problem of actually taking that away, my character of losing that, you know, that part of me. I was that guy that, that social entertained guy. Yeah. in the bars, yeah. And to take that away is huge. It's not only your business. It was my, you know, I'm looking at my wife thinking, is she still going to love me? if I'm not that guy, you know, and, and I think that's where people find this so difficult because it's actually, it's so endemic of, of everything they do. Yeah, I think so. I mean, socially we, we think of it as, um, it's become the social message of, you know, we're entitled to go and enjoy a glass of wine or enjoy a drink, or it's sort of the social message of what, what, we're entitled to well and some people actually feel more social when they drink it decreases their anxiety decreases their inhibitions and so they um are less self-conscious was that the case for for you or not really oh no very very much it's only recently i think i've realized that i'm quite introverted in many ways yeah i used alcohol as this this sort of Superman cape. To Almost turn like a social this, lubricant. Yeah. You know, it would turn me into this sort of flamboyant yeah. extrovert, which, which was, which really helped. I mean, again, I'm not going to point fingers and, and say that, that it didn't because actually it did at that time. But the problem is, and I think that happens to so many people, actually you almost find yourself self-medicating in some ways to get over that social anxiety. Um, and then actually that, becomes the problem eventually. What I really want to know is what what was the event or series of events that led you to the decision to stop? Like the actual very specific thing. Like was there something specifically? Yeah. It, it, in, in truth, there wasn't. It was a slow. And that's, again, another point you know, I want to get across. There wasn't this wonderful epiphany moment where you know, the, the, the gods were singing and I thought, hallelujah, I'm going to stop drinking. Because that was, that was really important to me that um, it was quite a slow event over time of, of experimenting and actually testing whether it was the, the alcohol that was holding me back. And I think that's another myth that, that uh, lots of people fall into is they, they're waiting for this, this moment, this perfect almost rock bottom. Now you are an athlete and athletes at a professional level are all about performance and optimizing their performance. And so um, were you feeling your performance was not what it could be and you're looking, it sounds like you're searching for a way to really elevate your game yeah, hundred percent. That's really the, the angle that I came at this from. It, it, it was again, so there wasn't an epiphany. It was more of, I want to be better. I want to be fitter, faster. How can I achieve that? And I started to look again at diet and exercise, but it was the alcohol really was, was the gateway, was the key, the cornerstone to unlocking all of these different things because suddenly without hangovers, I could train more. I wasn't phoning in sick like so many of us mm. do to the personal trainer and making up those embarrassing excuses at the last minute. Why one year? Because it rhymed with beer. <laughs> <laughs> because it rhymed with beer. 
<laughs> as silly as that sounds, I just need something big enough that would, would get people off my back. Again, you know, for me, and this is the same for so many people, if you walk into a room and you say you don't want to drink alcohol, the reaction is normally one of what? You know, you can't do that. If I went out of a client and said, I'm not drinking tonight, that's just not acceptable. <laughs> so I needed an excuse to be able to say, look, I'm just doing a challenge. And this is what I'm doing. Oh, One, you know, great. beer. And that would get everyone's attention. And that's really sort of spawned the idea for the whole, the whole movement. And, and it worked really well because it was a challenge. And people, I think, they admire a challenge and they like a challenge. So my clients then, instead of twisting my arm to drink, were actually quite supportive because they couldn't believe that, you know, me knowing my background and my history could ever survive even two weeks, let alone a year. So it sort of snowballed from there. So the question I have is, did it influence anyone else to make that same change just because you modeled that behavior? Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. And the whole reason we're here now is because Ruri Fairbanes, who you touched on earlier, bumped into me six months into my challenge. And we haven't spoken about this yet, but I lost about three stone, which is 42 pounds oh in weight. Oh my gosh. Just from, yeah, but- just from stopping the beer. Well, again, we, we can sort of dive into this, but not just from the calories of beer, but because I was able to train again. I wasn't, ah. again, calling them sick. And it's all those different things, yeah, that, that the marginal gains. One of the secrets to success, it reminds me of Jerry Seinfeld, you know, the American comedian. Yeah. And he wanted to be a great comedic writer, but he didn't have the discipline. And so what he did is he said, I have to write for 30 minutes a day. He challenged himself. And every day he did that, he would go to the calendar, you know, when we had paper calendars and circle the date and put um, a line through it. I did it. And after doing it for three weeks, he said, I'm never going to break the streak. So it's that challenge that motivates people to stay with it. I'm not going to break it. This is important to me. And then that becomes more important than the social pressure or what else. So uh, one year, no beer. When we come back, we are going to talk about habit change and what Andy has learned in helping um, thousands of people change their behavior. One year, no beer. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We are here with Andy Ramage. We're having a great discussion on one year, no beer. And, you know, here at Amen Clinics, we have looked at people's brains for the last 26 years. We have scanned nearly 130,000 brains on people from 111 countries. And one of the first things I looked, learned from looking at all these uh, brain scans is that alcohol is not a health food. What I saw is over time, it significantly decreases blood flow to the brain. So you're not as happy, you're not as sharp, you're not optimized. And, you know, I went through this whole um, period in American culture where people would drink two glasses of red wine a day and they go, it's a health food. (laughs) And I'm like, that's just the big lie. Um, And and you came to, to a similar conclusion, not based on imaging, but based on scanning your body. And so, so let's like talk about of your the life. benefits to you when you stopped drinking alcohol um, and then went on a campaign, on a challenge, really, to not drink for a year. Yeah, they were, they were huge, really, and not from the obvious um, negation of, of those hangover feelings. It, it really started, I think, with, well, let's start mentally. I would, I would suffer with anxiety the day after, which lots of people do, the, the beer fear, as it were. I'd, I'd wake up that following morning just not right, quite anxious, and almost 
I, I feel very lucky that I've never suffered with depression. But the, the one time that I, I could describe something that was like a, a de depression was after a very big drinking session. If that was like a Saturday evening type of um, that, that flowed into a late Sunday morning, I was that slipping almost into a hole and having to climb my way out. Um, only to then completely undo that, bash myself over the head and knock myself to the bottom of the hole on Wednesday again by going out on a long lunch and, and an evening out. So instantly, and I feel very fortunate, that disappeared. And it's never come back since because that clearly was 100% down to the way I felt mentally after um, a, a big night out or drinking too much alcohol. So that was a huge win right there for me, a huge win out of the trap. Um, and then followed by that, that flowed into my physical health because um, as we discussed in the first episode, what happened was suddenly I was able to train a lot and harder because I wasn't calling off sick. I wasn't suddenly going out on a Wednesday or a Thursday on a big lunch or a big dinner and then so hung over on a Friday morning that I didn't have the energy to train or the motivation to train. So suddenly I got this big streak of training hard Mentally, I felt so much better, so much more motivated, more productive. And that then combined, I completely addressed my diet. And this is, again, you know, it sounds extreme, but I was the stereotypical meat-eating, beer-drinking city broker. <laughs> and then I looked at my diet and said, actually, I'm eating these big steaks. They're not really, I could actually feel what they were doing to me because I couldn't blame it on a hangover or tiredness. And then I, I refined my diet. I became a vegetarian. I'm pretty much vegan today so all these combinations of, of things had a huge uh, effect on me uh, I, I mentioned previously i lost a lot of weight 42 pounds in weight my body fat went from 35 percent down to 10 percent you know i was back in the real shape at 40 years old or late 30s that i was when i was playing football uh, professionally in my 20s and that was huge for me that's amazing well and you know there's a wild card in here that's really important to understand People who play professional soccer um, often have suffered concussions and the scans I've done. So here at Amen Clinics, we did the world's largest study on active and retired NFL players and the level of damage was just awful. OK, that's yeah. not a big surprise now. Uh, it, culturally, it's accepted. Uh, but soccer is not that much different. No, in fact, we're, without saying names, we're seeing a famous soccer player this week. Um, and it's not uncommon for that to happen because of the headbutts and, you know, whatever you call it, headers, <laughs> whatever you call them, <laughs> with the ball. Yeah. And, and uh, so, and really, so really your brain because, was likely more vulnerable because of the repetitive trauma. And to heal it, that's the exciting. So the headline from our study is those brains can often be healed if you put them in a healing environment and having four, five, six, eight beers a week is not a healing environment, as you could just tell from how you felt. Yeah, and that's, it's a fantastic point. And I've, I've actually looked at a lot of that, that type of research on the American footballers and concussions because in football, uh, as you almost rightly said, they're called headers. That was perfectly in the end. We had the ball all the time. So although these are not, you know, knockout blows, we use our head as part of, you know, the game and, and the position that I've played in. I used it <laughs> a lot. And, and I think we, it's probably not really been revealed or uncovered the, the damage that that could potentially be doing. And then, as you pointed out, if you're putting that in the wrong environment, which is three or four, five, six beers every day, you know, the mental effect that that has, the cumulative effect that has over time, I think right. is very damaging. And, and now actually, it's very interesting. There's a the really famous um, cricketer, which is another strange game that we play over here, but it's, it's called cricket. Um, a guy called Freddie Flintoff. It was really well renowned as this stereotypical sort of larger than life beer drinking cricket player massive sportsman and ironically he did a study he was involved in a study on other players that had suffered mental health issues and whilst he was involved in this study he realized his own symptoms were starting to appear because he had, uh, was drinking too much and actually now he's a complete teetotal as well he doesn't drink at all and he's, he's a fantastic advert for what we do that's awesome. So, I mean, I want to talk about some of the practical things because people are hearing this and they're saying, gosh, it sounds amazing. 
not going to work for me because they've got this list of reasons in their head. You're an NLP guy, right? I, I do NLP. I love it. And so you've got this list of reasons that you have of reasons you can't do something or you can. So one of the things we hear a lot that we know of, um, especially for one thing for women is anxiety. So um, you've got hormonal anxiety, you've got social anxiety, that's one of the things. Um, or as you talked about, social lubricant. People are introverts, they want it because it helps them relax um, so that they can talk to people. Um, there's a whole host of reasons that people drink besides just being alcoholics. In fact, that's probably not the number one reason. So help us out. I w and the other thing I question I have for you is how long was it before you started noticing a pretty radical shift in feeling better? Yeah, to answer your the last question first, it was probably within that first month, really, mm -hmm. two to three weeks when actually my, my eyes felt bright again and the energy started to return. And just to dig a bit deeper on that one particular question, I think it's really interesting because most people start drinking, and I certainly did, in their teens, mm -hmm. and they never really stop. You know, so they never really get a break for long enough to actually realize what life was like before they felt a bit tired and a bit lethargic. And they just accept those things as just a natural part maybe of growing old when actually it's, it's, it's very, very often the alcohol that's having these cumulative negative effects. So that's why our challenge is so important, I think, to give people that look of, wow, this is 30 days without alcohol. I feel marvelous. This is what I've been missing out on. Um, and then to go back to answer those first questions, the challenge initially is all part of the habit change process. Come in, do a challenge. Um, there's never a perfect time to start. You know, the first thing that most people do when they look at a challenge such as this is they look at their diary and they say, oh, I'd love to do it, but I've got the birthday. No, oh, I'd love to do it, but I've got the wedding, but I've got the holiday. There's always that excuse. And actually what we've found that some of the most powerful moments are when you go to the wedding or the friend's birthday and you don't drink. And you actually prove to yourself that actually you can still go and be social and have a great time and skip those debilitating effects or those hangovers. And that's really, really powerful. And we see that all the time. People that don't think they can do it, they do the wedding. Like my biggest fear was how was I going to dance sober at weddings? <laughs> how are you going to dance fear. sober at weddings? That's hilarious. Yeah, you know, and it's silly and it's, it's, it's laughable, but that's exactly what we're talking about. It puts people off trying these new things because they're, they're, they're scared by it. So, again, the challenge process, we try and get people to do the, the shorter challenge, which is just 28 days. Can you do it? Can you do Can it in one it? month? Basically? See, I love that challenge free. part. Yeah. I, I yeah. just think that and it, is and it, it's is got to so start. Brilliant. It's got an end. So it's not daunting. It's not overwhelming. Can you come and do it and prove to yourself? And it's all about mindset, really. And we see this all the time. If you have a mindset, you're giving something up, you're missing out, or you have a mindset, I'm going to get all these amazing advantages. I'm going to feel great. My skin's going to look great. I'm going to be healthier. As soon as you can help people make that, that, that mindset shift, everything changes. We, we, we love that. So what did your wife say about all this? Well, yeah, I mean, she's a good Irish lady. In fact, the story is, which is true, <laughs> I fell in love with her because she drank pints of beer, which is a big... Big glasses of beer. So she could keep up, drink. right? <laughs> yeah. But in Ireland, lots of it, it's culturally slightly different to here, but they drink the, the big, big right. you know, pints that essentially men would normally drink. And I couldn't believe it when I first saw this pretty lady with this huge right. <laughs> glass of beer, effectively. <laughs> so, um, no, she, she's been amazingly supportive. And, and, you know, anything that's good for me is good for her. And, and that's another key part of this you know i'm not running around we're not pointing fingers or telling anyone off it's very much a case of leading by example yeah and i know that Agreed. my example is having a positive influence on people she still drinks but a, a way way less than, than she did before for example so no she totally gets it totally supports me and i can still just about dance at weddings so She's That's happy so funny. So let's talk about the practical aspect. So someone wants to stop doing this, but they've got this list of reasons in their head or, and some of those reasons are real. They're anxious. They're shy. They're uncomfortable in social situations. Whatever those reasons are, what are some practical things they can do? I'd love to hear from both of you, medical and social, um, what, what you guys think that people can do. Um, yeah, if, if I kick it off, a lot of what we do is, again, is that practical social side of things. For example, a lot of people's fear is 
telling people that they want to start this challenge. That they're scared because, again, if you, you walk into a room of, let's take my city example, and you tell people you want to stop drinking, it's the only drug in the world that people turn around and they berate you for it. You know, they tell right. you off for wanting to take a break from alcohol because they, they don't want to lose their drinking buddy. Um, so our tips are very practical. For example, take out the ringleader. There's always that one person, that one friend, that if you can get them on side, it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Because if they support you on this challenge, then you just watch the rest follow. Again, that's just a very quick, practical, practical tip. That's excellent. Yeah, so it's finding the lever person in your social circle. Right. And then, and, and my experience is tell them what you're doing, tell them why you're doing it, and then get a stiff backbone. So what can they do for the anxiety aspect for that? Well, there's real- so many other things to do. Um, so as a psychiatrist, I love teaching people to meditate. I love using hypnosis, self-hypnosis. I like certain supplements. Uh, we make something called serotonin mood support for people who are worried and they can't let go of negative thoughts or bad thoughts. It's got saffron, uh, the world's most expensive spice, but it's been shown to really help with depression and anxiety. Also 5-HTP, which is the amino acid building block for serotonin. Uh, We also make something called GABA calming support that raises GABA. And what GABA does is sort of what alcohol does without the hangover. Uh, GABA raises a neurotransmitter called GABA that calms down the overfiring we see in the brain that often goes with anxiety. But no one's going to get addicted to the GABA. It's not going to cause social problems uh, for, for them. Um, so one practical tip I have for people when I'm coaching them, um, sometimes people it's a social thing where they just want something to hold and to sip because they just don't know what to do. So we'll have them get sparkling water and add some lemon or lime or whatever, or fresh berries, make it pretty and put a few drops of stevia in it. That's just a practical solution. Um, and then I like to have something to to hold hold and to sip while you're in that environment. It's not full of sugar. Another, there's a new study on the game Tetris. So, you know, it's an app, you can download it to your phone, it's free. Most of us have played Tetris at some point in our life. You play for 20 minutes a day, decreases cravings for alcohol. Uh, I mean, well, how simple is that? You know, then just play Tetris on your That's phone. Um, there's also a, an interesting supplement I like a lot called N-acetylcysteine, which is a super antioxidant that actually has been shown to decrease the cravings for alcohol, marijuana, uh, and cocaine. Right. And it, it's something we actually put in a number of our products, especially craving control, just as a way to get your chemistry better balanced. So, so what else do you have to add to that, Andy? Yeah, uh, and all those points you've made are fantastic. We're big believers in mindfulness. That's a big part of, of what we do. Again, a bit, we try and do all these things without putting labels on them to, to sort of scare people off, especially lots of people that come to One You Know Beer may have never really heard of mindfulness before or right. meditation. So we try and ease them very much into this just by becoming more aware of their habits, becoming more aware of what they're actually doing and actually introducing mindfulness without labels, which I think helps. And also, it's to get really practical. As you said, for example, if someone's socially anxious, give them all those tips and tricks. Yours is a great tip there, actually, to, to, to maybe use even non-alcoholic lookalikes. That's what we do lots of. So the low-alcohol or non-alcohol beers, for example, are fantastic ways to ease your, ease your way into a social setting. You still feel part of the group, which is very important. Um, and lots of people leave you alone once you've got something that looks like alcohol. You don't get the constant barrage of questions, why you're not drinking, why you're not drinking. So I think that's another really um, important tip, I think, and also to always know what you're going to drink and have a backup plan. Because what catches a lot of people out, they go into that bar setting, and this is my experience on numerous occasions, and this is where we can look at the sort of social and psychological conditioning that surrounds us for years. If you're programmed yourself for 20 years to drink alcohol, you walk into a bar and you smell the crisps and you feel the ambiance right. and the bar person says, what do you want? I can't tell you how many times I had a sparkling water in mind. I'd get to the bar and I'd order a pint of lager. 
It's like a habit. It's so many times. It's those triggers. It's a habit. So when we come back, we are going to talk about habit change. Okay. And what Andy has learned in one year, no beer, and helping thousands of people change, habits are actually, they become burned into your brain. And so you actually end up saying yes before your frontal lobes say no. And so when when we come back with Andy Ramage, one year, no beer, um, you can actually go to oneyearnobeer.com and learn more uh, about Andy's journey and how he's been helping people around the world. Stay with us. So we're back. We're still with Andy Ramage and One Year No Beer. Um, We're having such a good time talking about why he went alcohol free, all the positive changes in his body, his brain, his performance. But now we're going to talk about the habits, why people do this, because I love what you said. You'd walk into a bar, you told yourself you were going to order water, but then you ended up ordering the beer. And that's a really important point because we get triggered by our by certain um anchors almost i'll call them like things that we are even unaware that we're being triggered by smell or sounds or uh you know the sight of something and with the best intentions in mind they go right out the window so talk to us about you know habits like how did you change that habit and what have you learned about yeah. habit change and helping others uh, yeah and just to uh, delve into that point a a bit more. It's really interesting because what happens is, and this is when everything changed for me, this is when I started to get into NLP, started to get into positive psychology and understand that actually our rational decisions don't always play out. And very often- They're not always that rational, are they? (laughs) Yeah, it's that limbic part of our brain, that, that, that primitive part of our brain that takes over. And it's so important to know because for example, when I gave that, that, that routine there, I'd get to the bar and I'd order an alcoholic drink, even though I told myself I wasn't going to do that. That is such a key moment because I started to doubt myself. You start to think, maybe I've got this problem. Maybe my genes are faulty. Um, I was embarrassed that I couldn't follow through. Maybe I was a willpower failure. And I think at that very point, so many people give up. And what they do is they stay with the crowd. It's much easier to keep drinking because then no one would ever notice that I was actually this willpower failure that I'd made up in my mind. And it's such an important point. And, and we really go into this within One You Know Beer to, to catch people in that moment to say, actually, do you know what? You're behaving perfectly rational for someone who's been programmed, as we said, psychologically and socially for all of these years to do these things. You are going to slip up every now and again. You are going to order the, the lager when you, or the glass of wine when you really wanted a sparkling water. If that happens, don't panic. Firstly, you don't have to drink it just because you bought it. You know, you put the drink down and good point. walk away where we can see your hand. You know, and, and it's, it's that almost education. I, it starts right there to tell people it's not the end of the world. Don't let this be an excuse. And there's lots of research behind this. I think it's a Janet Povey from the dieting world first discovered this. It's called What the Hell Effect because people would reach that point where they'd say they're not going to drink. They'd accidentally have a drink or a cream cake. And that becomes this big excuse to let the floodgates open and drink 10 drinks or eat 10 cakes when actually, do you know what, it's just one slip. You know, you, you, you know psychologically you've been programmed to do this stuff. You've tripped up. Don't worry about it. End it there. Learn from your mistake and come back stronger. And that's, that's, this is a real fundamental part of, of what we're doing around habit change is to catch those initial mistakes, learn from them, and, and start to come back stronger. So one of the things, um, you know, in treating addicts for many, many years, uh, addiction treatment centers come up with this uh, mnemonic called HALT, and I would add to that, but it's don't let yourself get too hungry because when you have low blood sugar, you have low blood flow to the front part of your brain, which is the brain's break, and it stops you from doing things you don't want to do. Um, And so don't go too long without eating healthy food. Um, Don't get too angry. 
negative emotion tends to turn off the judgment centers of your brain. Um, so don't get too hungry, angry, lonely, because when you start to feel disconnected from others, then people go and medicate themselves or tired because if people get less than seven hours of sleep at night, they have low overall blood flow to the brain, which means they're going to make more bad decisions. And then we would add, and we joked on our first podcast about, you know, you're in London, the sun doesn't come out much, but low vitamin right. D levels Triggers also cravings. are associated yeah. with higher cravings, more depression, and more issues with judgment. So, so there's, I mean, some really simple things. Once you make the decision to change how you support it. And I loved what you said, which is if you slip, well, don't fall and crack your head. Um, learn from it and go, well, okay. So whenever I have patients that slip and they slip all the time, um, we actually have somebody in our family who's had some serious problems. And, and when she slept, the, the question is, okay, I want to learn all about it. You know, rather than judge someone as, oh, you're bad. Um, it's, well, let's learn from it. So it doesn't happen, have to happen again. Did you go too long without eating? Did you believe every stupid thing you thought? Um, did you not sleep well? What? One of the things I want to push on a little bit, Andy, because it's so important, I've done a lot of work in NLP myself in the area of performance and, and just clearing some of the past triggers that I've had. And I think it's amazing. It's like this amazing shortcut. Um, so I love it. And one of the things I love about NLP is that one of the things that Daniel talks a lot about and that I love, um, you know, from a brain perspective is how our template sometimes gets set. Our emotional brain, we have these patterns or these templates that get set at certain times in our life for whatever reason. And what I love about NLP is that doing that that assessment, the way that you can you can step back and you actually can take a look at when did it get set? Why did it get set? How did it get set? And you can actually fairly quickly break that pattern. Now that's not gonna address the physical part of it, but it does address that part of it, like how did that template get set and how can I redirect that? How can I reset that? So I love yeah, that. I mean that yeah, exactly. We, we incorporate a lot of NLP quite subtly, again, not necessarily so much pattern change, interrupt, but we use it very much from a visualization point of view. So right. to go into the whole habit change system now, so we start to look at the, the science of habit change, how they form triggers. So we get people to find out what all their triggers are. It could be 6 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. Then we look at their routines. What's the routine they're playing? Right, They might go to the, the bar and have a few drinks. And then what we're really interested in is what's the reward? What is it they're after? Is it, right. the, you know, the social camaraderie of being with friends? Is it a chance to relax? What, what is it? And that's so key because a lot of the time people are actually playing these routines, which is the alcohol routine, to get something that they could achieve without alcohol. Right. And that's really important. And then what we, we use then, we couple that with, with um, visualization. Again, it's a, it's a great technique, you know, from sporting world and, and from NLP to get people to rehearse in their mind. What are they going to do? That Friday night trigger comes. What's the routine? What's the reward? Because obviously the beauty of visualization is such a key skill that you can do it a hundred times in your head, but you can't walk into that bar a hundred times and play that scenario. So I think right. it's a really important part and, and it works. It works extremely well. So one thing so that he's doing, he's talking about relapse prevention, right. which is predicting where the vulnerable right. areas are and then coming up ahead of time with a strategy for dealing with that. So this is a very different environment, but sort of an interesting kind of example. I was getting ready to take my black belt test and I didn't want to take it. And I actually told my master, I don't want to take it because where I train very high level um, athletes and I'm older and I had this whole list. I'm not as strong. I'm not as big. I'm, not, I'm too old. I'm whatever. This whole list of I have health issues. And, and I didn't understand why because I've my whole life been an athlete, but I just couldn't get myself in that place to, st I couldn't see myself standing next to these people with a belt on. And so when I did some NLP, what I, people don't even understand. So this is where I like what you said about consciousness. They don't understand 
and they don't pay attention to what they're really seeing in their head. So when I had someone walk me through this process, and this is so important, we stopped and slowed down. And what I was seeing in my head were these people who were much bigger than me, who were much stronger than me. I was smaller, I was weaker, and I wasn't performing the same. But when I became conscious of it, I literally physically shrunk them down in my head to my size, made them normal sized, made myself their size, and went through the visualization process of not only performing, you know, 110%, and then I visualized myself 15 minutes after the test wearing that belt. And I can't even tell you what that did for me, but it was seeing them bigger than me and stronger than me and me weak that just was was holding me back the whole time. People don't see that they do that even in this situation of drinking alcohol. It's bigger than them or the, the social environment is too complicated or it's, um, you know, whatever it is that picture that they've created, they make it bigger in their head than it needs to be. Yeah, that, that's a great example. And we have one, we call it the crossroads. Um, it's not about sort of changing the sort of dynamic of the picture in many ways, but it, it's that visualization, a bit, a bit like what you said there, where you come 15 minutes after you've achieved the, the black belt, how did you feel? And we have one with the crossroads, which is you can, you, you know, you, you meet the path and you can choose that path of continue with your old habits or you can take the path of this new, healthy, bright, vibrant you and then we fast forward to that six months later, how do you feel, what are your emotions? And these things are so powerful, I love it again, it's all the NLP stuff, but it is so powerful to take people, I think, out of their current settings and those, those, those stuck mentality that they've got and give them that hope, that light, actually, look, this, I can really achieve this and this is what it's gonna feel like. And that's very powerful, I think, around habit change. Yeah, no, it's awesome, because, I mean, who's gonna possibly be able to succeed if what they see in their head is that they're weaker or smaller or unsuccessful or that they can't they can't say no to peer pressure or y it's really hard to succeed but if you just shift that picture a little bit and you see yourself in a different light you see yourself as an athlete you see yourself as this powerful person you know it changes it's a game changer i mean it just yeah, it's a game changer and then, and then to, to to couple that as part of this challenge on the alcohol free challenge you're doing this visualization but then every day you're proving to yourself that actually you can do this so it's reinforcement self-confident yeah and it just and then it snowballs and it links together and you become stronger and stronger and more confident and everything starts to change and that, that's huge i love that so how can people learn more about you and your work um really simple uh, one you know beer.com if you go there, you can sign up. All the information is there. All the videos are there. Come and join in the fun. Again, this is all about not giving something help. It's about gaining a huge advantage. And, and just to be clear, this is not an abstinence program. This is very much a prevention, label-free, stigma-free challenge. That's all it is. Come and enjoy it. Come and check it out. And if you enjoy it, great. Carry on with it. Fantastic. One year, no beer. Andy Ramage, thank you so much, so much for fun. your time. Uh, it was great fun, and we will share this everywhere we can. That's fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Andy. All right, Andy, take care. You're listening Thanks to the Brain much. Warriors Way podcast. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We have a special gift for you. It's an opportunity to win an evaluation at the Amen Clinics. All you have to do is subscribe to this podcast, leave a review, and rate us on iTunes. To learn more about Amen Clinics and the work we do, go to amenclinics.com. You can also learn about our nutraceutical products at brainmdhealth.com. Thanks for listening.